Hey everybody, Steve here, and in this video, or series of videos, uh, we're going to talk about biblical self-defense. But what we should first look at is a little bit of what we're talking about. And since I live in the United States, and the majority of people that have answered or asked questions in relation to uh, is there even such an animal as biblical self-defense? Can we defend ourselves and our family against violent criminals uh, using uh, weapons of today uh, or weapons of yesterday? It doesn't really matter. As a Christian... Or, or is there a call or a command to be a total pacifist and not to raise our hand uh, when we have the strength and the opportunity to save somebody uh, from being a victim of a violent crime, uh, rape, murder, torture, you know, whatever the case may be. That's what we're going to look at. Now I'm just going to go over a few things. I've got a bunch of notes because uh, recently I had somebody say, you know what, Steve, you need to look at Scripture, you need to look at the truth, and look in God's Word, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you'll find the truth. Um, well, that's, that's what I ended up doing, and it's going to be very interesting. Before we get into the truth, let me just give you a few little details about the United States, which is where I live. We live in a country that has approximately 250 million plus guns or weapons in, in, guns in our uh, country. And there's approximately 300 million plus people. Uh, furthermore, our country has estimated that the law-abiding citizens defend themselves with firearms anywhere from one to two million times a year. And the majority of the time, not even one shot is fired. So what we're looking at, and again, it's uh, FBI crime statistics, police statistics, uh, that has gone on for decades and decades. And what we see is one to two million times a year, average everyday citizens defend themselves with firearms against those who want to do harm against them. In other words, uh, it's a home invasion. Uh, it's somebody who is, wants to commit a violence against that person, uh, rape, torture, even murdering that, that person or persons. All those were prevented by an average citizen who took the responsibility to defend themselves and their family. And that's, uh, you know, one to two million times. And again, what we need to ask ourselves is, again, it's not what the United States does. It's not what some other country does, but it's what the Bible shows. And we're going to look at the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, uh, it's really interesting because we're going to look at the Old Testament first. The one thing that we need to know is that God never changes. Scripture says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so how God deals with the things such as the sanctity of life and uh, his laws and how we deal with sin and uh, how sin is forgiven is all seen in the Old Testament and also fulfilled in the New Testament. We see those same themes carrying over. And uh, likewise, there are things in the, in the Old Testament, which was the Old Covenant, which has been done away with, including the new, in the New Covenant, the New and Everlasting Covenant, covenant of Jesus Christ. Many times we see Jesus in the Gospels talking about, you have heard it said, uh, but he's going back and saying how the priests and how people had twisted and manipulated and went off of, well, this is how it is, but Jesus brings him back and he goes, but it is written. And he expounds on God's Old Testament law and he brings it forward into the New and Everlasting Covenant where it reaches past just our actions, but it goes to our thoughts and what is in our heart. And uh, that's the important thing is addressing our sin. But when it comes to self-defense, we have to look at the whole context of God's word. And that includes the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is really interesting because those people that say, you know, that to be a Christian, you have to be a total pacifist. In other words, you can't raise your hand. You can't say, well, you know what? Somebody broke into my house and uh, they're torturing my little boy. They're raping my wife and daughter and uh, they're killing the dog. And you know what? I... You know, I, I can't really do anything because I'm not, I, that wouldn't be trusting in God. Hmm, really. Um, Got to turn the other cheek. You know, it's God will provide. Well, you've heard that story of the young man or the gentleman uh, where there was a flood and it ends up the floodwaters got higher and higher and he climbs up on the roof and the floodwaters keep getting higher. A boat comes by and the guy says, no, I'm trusting in God. And then... Uh, 
you know, an, another boat comes by and he goes, come on, we'll help you. And he goes, no, no, no. He says, I'm trusting in God. And then a helicopter comes by and, uh, you know, he says, no, he waves the helicopter off. He says, no, no, I'm trusting in God. Next thing you know, the floodwaters overtake the man. He dies and he goes to the pearly gates and he asks God, he says, God, I don't understand. He says, you know, I was trusting in you. And he says, well, you know, I sent you a couple boats and a helicopter. What gives? Um, it, it's, it's a kind of a funny joke, but we'll see. Uh, how God deals with mankind in our responsibility and what his word says, because that's what's important. Uh, in Exodus 22, chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. Now, it's interesting because the basic take is, um, say there's a home invasion. Two o'clock in the morning, somebody breaks into my house you know, with the intent of doing harm or robbing my property. I don't know because it's night. And that if I go ahead and I take a firearm and I defend my family and myself and uh, I kill that person, not that I want to, uh, but if they, if they push it to the limit where I'm fear of my life or the lives of my family members, I will use lethal force to subdue that threat or to make it so they cannot uh, complete that violent action against me or my family. As a Christian... Uh, I feel that is a totally appropriate response if he keeps intending uh, to do violence against me or my family. Somehow, there's people out there who have said, you know what, well, if you're a Christian, you've got to be a total pacifist. The interesting thing is, when we look at the Old Testament, let's see what God's Word says. Exodus 22, verses 2 and 3. It tells us, if the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. Wow. The exact scenario is if somebody breaks in, a thief breaks in or somebody breaks in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. So what we are seeing here is that if somebody breaks into your house, a thief no less, uh, and you strike him, either it could be with a club, it could be with a, you know, a knife, a firearm, however you strike him that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. Isn't that interesting? It says, if the sun has risen on him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He should make full restitution if he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. What's really interesting about this is that there is that differentiation, uh, that difference between night and day. Because if somebody breaks into my house at 2 o'clock in the morning in the middle of the night, uh, I don't know who that person is. So... Uh, their intent on, on taking my property, pro probably, uh, you know, doing violence against me or my family. And the Bible in Exodus 22, verses 2 and 3, totally justifies that response, even to the point where if you kill them, it's not saying that you should, but even if you do, uh, you're not guilty of, of shedding his blood. Uh, that, that's scripture right there. So in other words, this whole, you know, well, if you're a Christian, you know, there's no example in the Bible showing where self-defense is something that we cannot do. Uh, Exodus 22, verses 2 and 3 totally disproves that. Now, here's the conclusion that can be drawn from this, is that the threat of our life is to be met with lethal force or can be uh, met with lethal force. Now... I never have told anybody to go straight to lethal force. If somebody is breaking into my house, uh, what I would rather do, and because you know it's not daylight out, is that I will give loud verbal commands. I'll use a tactical light that is on my pistol to uh, illuminate that individual, give loud verbal commands to identify whether, and give him the opportunity to get out of my house. Um, because I have a family, I have a wife and a daughter to think of, not only myself. And I'm commanded to love my wife and provide for my family, not only food and uh, water and protection and shelter and spiritual headship, but also for their safety, uh, as same with orphans and widows. But anyway, so we can realize that we can even go up to lethal force, but I don't even, don't jump straight to that. Give that person the opportunity to leave with their life, because life is sacred. Um, it, but during the day, we can recognize and later apprehend that thief. In other words, we can see and they can get the full impact of, hey, 
you need to get out of my house so he can fully understand the consequences of what he's doing. And then again, uh, you know, you can make that identification. Clearly, what we see here is that self-defense is not vengeance. You know, you'll see a lot of these uh, Christians saying that, claiming that you have to be a total pacifist. Well, vengeance is, is the Lord's. It's not ours. It's not ours to take revenge. Well, obviously, Exodus 22, verses 2 and 3, clearly shows that defending yourself and your family is not an act of vengeance, but rather you are, you are pre preventing that individual uh, from committing crimes. And that's even to the point of using lethal force. Um, it's the other thing. We also conclude that since Jesus did not forbid uh, Exodus 22 uh, and verses 2 and 3 in the New Testament, believers can defend themselves and their family and their property. What's interesting is that Jesus uh, talked about the Old Testament law and then he expounded on it and included and even took it a step further. Well, but we don't see where Jesus says, you know, hey, that part about Exodus, about defending yourself and your family, uh, we're done away with that. We see zero examples of that in Scripture. None. Nada. Uh, and we'll see some really interesting things in the New Testament as well. Um, basically, what we see here is that there are some other things that we're going to look at in Exodus 22, verses 2 and 3. Um, that if somebody breaks into your house in the middle of the night and you kill them, you're not held guilty of murder. Murder is killing without just cause or taking an innocent life. What that person had done had broke, broken the law, broken God's law, apparently, and broken the law of men uh, at the same time of taking against you and your family, which is taking against what God has put on this earth. Um, they understand that at night... Uh, you're blameless of the criminals killed in that situation during the nighttime. And it makes it clear that if a man is breaking in for theft or rape or murder or whatever the case is, that you have the right to defend yourself with and up to including lethal force. Now, again, here's the interesting thing is that the second case, if the sun has risen and the thief has come into your home, uh, that you have... Uh, you can stop that person. It shows a level of force, a thief. In other words, you can clearly identify that this person is a thief from stealing your property and that you should apprehend him and that the civil magistrate or the local government, the police, should be able to take and put him into custody and, and uh, the judge should uh, give him sentence uh, as we see throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, it's interesting that uh, that all these things... We look at the Old Testament and we see lots of different crimes. We see uh, the crime of theft is not worthy of death. But we do see that kidnapping is worthy of death and as was murder. We used to look at that Exodus 21.16, Deuteronomy 24.7. Now here's another example of a New Testament. It's Nehemiah chapter 4 verses 8 through 32. Now basically this is dealing with citizens of Israel. It's not talking about law enforcement. It's not talking about the army, but it's talking about citizens who are armed. And uh, it talks about that the people were stationed, uh, people by families around the city as they were building the temple, and that these families were armed with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And uh, they were willing to apply lethal force to defend themselves. Now, it's interesting because uh, you know, people say, you know, well, your, your gun is, is high tech. There's nothing in the Bible that talks about uh, firearms. Well, a bow shoots a projectile that can kill a person. Uh, this is just a more advanced type of bow. It shoots a projectile that can kill a person or wound a person or scare that person away. Again, it can be a show of force uh, or it can even be used as lethal force. But anyway, it ends up that uh, in Nehemiah chapter 4, what was going on is it had all these bad guys surrounding the Israelites. And so as they worked and as they went about, they helped each citizen protected uh, other people by being stationed around the city with the weapons that they had. Now, you have to look at the context and you have to look that this was not a standing army. This was everyday citizens. And we'll see that theme throughout the Old Testament that uh, the government and the military the military wasn't a special organization like we have in the United States, but it was citizen soldiers that each were armed because each 
was given the opportunity to defend themselves and their family and their property, but then they could also be called on to defend Israel in a time of need. Um, we continue on, and it says it's interesting how they were called to defend themselves. Nehemiah 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 14 specifically says, Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. It is good and right to defend your family, even uh, even using up to lethal force. So again, for those people who say, you know, well, the, no, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say anywhere uh, that you can defend your family. Well, here it says, fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your property, your houses. Um, now, it's interesting that in self-defense, these citizens didn't merely own these weapons, but they were perceived a risk of harm to their persons and they carried these weapons with them. It's like the concealed carry laws that we have today or the open carry laws uh, that we have today with the intent and the purpose of using those weapons to defend themselves. So what we see is uh, parallels in the Old Testament that apply to us today. It's almost the same. Uh, nothing has changed uh, except for the fact that uh, we have a lot more crime now than even back then. Uh, it talks about it also in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 17. Those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other hand holding a weapon. As for the builders, each wore a sword girdle at his side as he built. Uh, so we carried on with the work, half of them holding spears from dawn until the stars appeared. Um, later on, so... I, so neither I, my brothers, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us removed our clothes. Each took his weapon even to the water. So it's not a weapon that was given to them by the military, but it was their own weapons that they used to defend themselves and their family. And they used the weapons as they were building this wall in chapter 4 of Nehemiah. Uh, the other passage that we want to look at is Esther uh, 8 and 9. The Old Testament passage we examine. Uh, Esther and what happens and that the Jews were under the threat of racial violence. Uh, the civil authority of the king grants some legal permission to use lethal force in self-defense. I'm not making this up. Uh, Esther chapter 8 verses 11 and 12. By these letters the king permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and to protect their lives. To kill, to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions. So again, we see another clear example in the Old Testament, and obviously it wasn't forbidden by God because there was no prophet that said, Oh, wait a second, you've got to be a total pacifist. You've got to let somebody rape, torture, and murder your, your wife and your kids and your children. And No, we don't see that at all, but rather we see that that king had given them the ability and the okay to protect their lives and destroy or kill those who were intent on destroying and killing them. And again, we don't see anything in the Old Testament where Almighty God said, you know, nope, nope, can't do that. But rather, we see the sanctity of life and that he cares, but he also holds uh, people to a standard for their actions. It's not the weapon. A lot of these uh, Christian pacifists that say you can't have any type of weapon, you can't defend yourself at all, uh, will make that claim that, ooh, this is evil. No, it is not. It is amoral. It is an inanimate object, just as this pen is. And matter of fact, uh, I can do a lot of damage with this pen up close and personal than I can with a firearm when it comes to self-defense. But again, God didn't forbid the use of swords or bows and arrows or spears, and, but he did uh, regulate the actions of people. That there is a time, Look in uh, what was the passage in Scripture where it talks about there's a time to kill and a time to heal. Okay, There's the appropriate time. You don't just go out and wantonly attack anybody, but you are given the permission, and we see in Scripture in the Old Testament, to defend yourselves, your family, and your possessions. Um, and again, what we see here in Esther uh, is those that were intent, who hated the Jews and intended to do violence against them, that they were given the okay to protect their lives and their families and their loved ones. So anyway, in Esther uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. The Jews gathered together in the cities throughout all the provinces of King Azarias uh, to lay hands on those who sought them their harm. And no one could withstand them because fear fell, uh, 
because fear of them fell upon all people. Thus the Jews defeated all their enemies with a stroke of the sword, with slaughter and destruction. Wow, that is huge. Um, but when you're coming against somebody who is intending to wipe you out and slaughter and massacre you, wipe you off the face of the earth, um, apparently it's okay. What we see is a given legal sanction to defend their lives with lethal force. And they, they do not choose nonviolence or that pacifist, okay, do whatever you want, step all over me, rape and murder me, uh, me and my family, go ahead, you know, God bless, you know, you're good to go. Um, this is another example of the widespread use of where weapons either knives or spears or bows and arrows that shoot projectiles, kind of like these shoot projectiles, to defend themselves and their families. Um, the other thing that we often hear from these Christian pacifists is that the possessions of weapons, uh, you know, guns and knives and all this stuff is, and defending yourself is wrong, it's evil, it's satanic, uh, it's there's nothing further from the truth because if you do it to defend your wife or defend your children, you are providing for them, you're loving them, you're, you're protecting them. It's interesting that uh, there's a number of passages where uh, the use of weapons and the skill of, of that weapon is something good and it is portrayed as a positive or a desirable thing. Uh, Zechariah 9.14, Psalms 7.13, Psalms 18.14, Psalms 21.12, uh, Habakkuk 3.11, Deuteronomy 34.42, 2 Samuel 22.15. Uh, the scriptures with the sword come to mind. Uh, we see that in the New Testament. We'll get to that a little bit later. What's interesting is that the possession of weapons was never forbidden by God in the Old Testament. Why? Because you were protecting the lives of of people. And God gives us the opportunity. He gives us, uh, if you're the, the man of your house, you are given charge for the public safety for your family. Um, we see, in the, and again, what we see is we don't see any forbidden uh, use of saying, oh, you can't use your sword or anything to defend yourself. As a matter of fact, God says, take away all the weapons. Do we ever see that in the Old Testament? No, we do not. Uh, 1 Samuel 13, 19 through 22 says, there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. But they were found with Saul and Jonathan his son. Uh, let's look at these two verses in Psalm. Psalm 144 verse 1. Bless the Lord my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight, or my fingers to battle. Psalm 1834, he teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. This is showing the skill and the ability of using those weapons. And it, it's, it's not a metaphor, it's not a play on words, but rather these verses show that uh, we can defend ourselves. Uh, it's, now here's the interesting thing. When we talk about these pacifist Christians and say, you know, you can't defend yourself at all, you've got to turn the other cheek, and, you know, the men of violence will be, uh, you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Um, I don't make my living by misusing this to abuse its power to go against the rights of other people, their life, liberty, and their pursuit of happiness, as what we see in Scripture. I don't go against and abuse that power of using any type of weapon uh, to kill, rape, murder, or steal something from somebody else because that's wrong. Those are the people who are, they make their life uh, by the sword, will die by the sword. Because you're abusing that power. You're attacking people that are innocent. And that's what we see in Scripture is that, hey, you don't kill innocent people. Um, it's interesting that... Uh, this also comes to the point of where people will say, well, you're not trusting in God, you know. You, you, have, you have that, and you're trusting in that more than you are God. Um, that false logic is exactly that, false. Uh, we see that guns and knives and weapons are merely tools, and that none of these things guarantee protection. Uh, any more than owning a fire extinguisher in your house guarantees that your house won't burn down. Um, it's interesting in Psalms 44, verses 6 and 7, For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. 
but you have saved us from our enemies and you have put shame on those who hated us. But wait a second. We saw just in those other verses before where the Lord teaches my hands for war and for battle to be proficient in those things. We see many examples of where the Israelites did defend themselves and did defend their families. But they didn't trust in the bow. What did they trust in? They had skill and they were proficient with the weapons that they had, but their ultimate trust was in God because he is the one that has the final say. Um, it's interesting that we also see scriptures in the, in the Old Testament where it talks about, you know, well, uh, God's going to fight the battle for us. But we see instances where, you know, there's only a handful of Israelites and they had weapons, but uh, God allowed it. So those people that uh, fought or were defending Israel uh, had a great and mighty victory. Was it that the people had uh, trust and more trust in the weapons than they did God? No, but they were proficient at it, but they trusted in God for the outcome. Um, do not put your trust in weapons. They are tools that are useful, but they are only dead, inanimate objects. And uh, at the end of the day, when we look at uh, 1 Samuel 17, 47, it says, The Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's. In other words, I do not gain comfort or solace or thinking that I'm going to be victorious. God has the ultimate say. But we see that, obviously, in the Old Testament, Go ahead and to make yourself skilled. The Lord makes us, uh, in those verses before, you know, makes us a skilled warrior. Um, trains my hands for battle. But again, the ultimate, uh, everything ultimately goes back to God. Um, Ecclesiastes 3, that's the passage I was telling you about. For, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to kill and a time to heal. That's uh, Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 and 3. Now, Again, we get back to that part where it talks about people, uh, these um, pacifist Christians who say, well, the scripture says that you're not supposed to do it, but obviously there's a lot that scripture has to say in the Old Testament. Well, it gets to the point of where they say, well, you don't trust God if you've got one of these. Um, you know, that's totally wrong. And you're training on how to, to use this and defend yourself and your family. That's totally wrong because you're not trusting in God. See, gotcha, gotcha. Again, let us go back to Scripture. Uh, indeed, God will take care of us. Um, he also told us that if we love him, we'll keep his commandments in John 14, 15. Those entrusted to God work for a living, knowing that 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We also see the Scripture where it talks about and says, uh, If a man does not work, he does not eat. Um, but yet... Uh, expect to eat because he was trusting God would actually defy what we see in Scripture. In other words, you can't say, you know, well, you use this or you train with this, uh, you're not trusting in God. Because we see other examples where, you know, you're supposed to work. You're not supposed to just sit back and say, well, God's going to feed me and I don't have to do a darn thing. Okay, we see where uh, God is sovereign and man is accountable for his actions. Okay, but ultimately everything goes back to God. Uh, what we see here is that uh, King David wrote in Psalm 46 verse 1 that God is our refuge, our strength, our very present help in times of trouble. This did not conflict with praising the God who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle in Psalm 144 verse 1. The doctrine of scripture is that we prepare and work, but we trust God for the outcome. Kind of like in the New Testament where it talks about, you know, well, Lord willing, we will do this and do that. But again, ultimately, uh, God has the final say on what the outcome will be. So we trust in him, we prepare, but he, he's going to do what he's going to do. Um, it's interesting that uh, we look at that other scripture where, you know, where we're supposed to provide for our family, that if you don't work, you don't eat. Um, that, that logic that these Christian pacifists say that, that there, are, there is no self-defense in the Bible, that they forget that whole thing of, well, there's other examples. If you don't provide for your family, why doesn't everybody just not work and say, God, you know, I'm trusting in you to give me everything that I need. No, we see those commands to work, to be like the ants and not be like that sluggard. You know, consider the ant, you sluggard. Uh, see how he works and stores up, you know, for, for the times of winter. Don't be like the grasshopper. It just eats up everything that's out there. 
there's a time to prepare, and that also comes uh, with self-defense. It's interesting that um, some of the things that these pacifist Christians will end up saying is that, you know, well, it's, it's up to the police to defend you. Um, really, uh, that's... If you look at the crime statistics and the majority of the people that are victims of home invasions, violent crimes, uh, torture, murder, rape, worse, sodomy, whatever else the case is, you'll see that the police usually come after the fact. Now, I know a lot of people in blue uh, for some strange reason, and it's not that they can't, but it is just physically impossible that you only have this small amount of a police force for a town that has 150,000 people, guess what? Uh, police might be involved in a shooting or a rape over here and then on your side of town when there's a home invasion, and you can't take them to court. You can't take them to court and say, well, it's your responsibility to protect, to protect me. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, Anyway, there's a difference between what the government can provide and our responsibility as individuals. Um, what is Again, we go back and we talk about how the Bible in the Old Testament, that God, he doesn't deal with weapons and ban them or forbid them, but he focuses on the individual's actions and whether you do those things in the right time, in the right place, or you misuse that responsibility and power of that weapon. Uh, responsibility only pertains to people and not to things. Again, this is not evil. It's the exact same as this. It is an inanimate object. Um, resisting an attack is not to be confused with taking vengeance, which is exclusively in God's domain or ultimately his responsibility, as we see in Romans 12, 19. Uh, now, we also have to understand with the government that they bear that rod of judgment and punishment uh, for good reason. Uh, as we read in Romans 13, uh, verse 4, it is God's, is God's minister for you to do good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. It talks about that civil magistrate, the police, the, uh, the military, that's why you should do good. That's another reason. I mean, you should do good because God tells you to do good. Okay, that should be enough right there. But again, this is another worldly example of how the police are there for a reason, and it's to help keep the peace and keep the public safe. But unfortunately, we know that that is not the case each and every single time, but rather why there is still the need to protect our lives and our families and our property, as we've seen in those other Old Testament verses. Uh, private men, vengeance, we have to understand what vengeance is. You know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That is true. But if somebody is coming to attack me or my family, I am not seeking vengeance. Look at the definition of vengeance. But what I am doing is preventing that person from killing me or harming me or my family. You know, I will use the appropriate level of force. In Scripture, According to Exodus 22, verses uh, 2 and 3, is that if they come in at night and, I, and it gets to the point where I have to kill them, I am not guilt, guilty of their blood. Um, a lot of Christian pacifists don't like the Old Testament because it really, ooh, yeah, it really, really shatters their, their logic and their case of saying, well, it's not, you can't defend yourself, that's wrong in the Bible. Wow, what are we seeing? Um, we also will hear these uh, pacifists. Uh, say that, you know, thou shalt not kill. Again, if you look at the original language and you look at the definition, you'll see that it's you shall not kill without just cause, or rather you shall not murder or in kill somebody who's innocent that doesn't deserve it. And what's really interesting is when we look at the Old Testament, we see, like, for example, the false prophets. If there was a false prophet, his punishment was to be stoned to death. Now, in the New Testament, the New and Everlasting Covenant of Jesus Christ, we see where it has been changed, where we're not supposed to kill and stone and kill false prophets, but rather that is changed as a new covenant law of, whether we're supposed, of what we're supposed to do is to warn people, to rebuke those false prophets, to pre present the truth of God's word, and hopefully that they will repent. So like in the book of Jude, it's like as if we're snatching them from the fires of false teaching in hell. Uh, but again, if they don't repent and rebuke, guess what? 
uh, their actions are on their head. And if they don't listen to the rebuke, then we're supposed to publicly warn others so that they don't fall into the same sin. Um, same here with um, for people and talking about defending yourselves, we don't see any change or for any anything in the New Testament that talks about forbidding uh, defending yourself, your family, or your property. Now, we get up to the point of where it's interesting that, uh, oh, here, here's a great part here. The point, now the legal doctrine in the United States is what I want to get to. Repeatedly, the courts have held that the government has no responsibility to provide individual security. In other words, self-defense for you, the individual. One case of Bowers versus DeVito put it this way, there is no constitutional right to be protected by the state against being murdered. And that's what we see in the Old Testament in the Bible is that that responsibility is placed on the individual. Now, am I saying that every Christian needs to get a bunch of these? And no, I'm not saying that at all. If you do not want to carry a firearm, if you don't want to defend yourself, if you want to sit back and watch as your, your wife and your family are being tortured, sodomized, raped, killed in front of you, and you say, no, oh, I can't, I've got to turn the other cheek, I'm a Christian, I can't raise my hand against anybody, um, that's, that's up to you. And I'm, I'm not going to, that's your choice. You're going to be accountable for your actions. And I'm not going to say, you know, well, you're not a Christian, you're not a brother, he's evil or whatever. I think it's a disservice that you wouldn't try to protect your family as what we see in Scripture in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We're getting there. But I'm not going to uh, disfellowship from believers who choose not to defend themselves. Um, with, now, remember, there's a very big difference between dying for the gospel and then protecting yourself. Again, that's a whole other study. That could be a couple of hours right there in itself. Um, we talk about the New Testament and that self-defense in the New Testament. Uh, the Christian who says, you're not supposed to protect yourself. That's evil. These things are Satan's tools and stuff like that. We see no example of that in the Old Testament, nor do we see it in the New Testament. But let's look in the New Testament and see what we do see. Um, Anyway, it talks about how in Exodus 22 that it's justifiable uh, even to the point of using lethal force to kill a thief in the night or somebody who breaks into your home, a uh, bunch of other commands. And we have to understand that in Scripture, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, we see in Hebrews 13:8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We also see in Genesis where uh, Almighty God and, and you know, they're talking, Jesus obviously is in the, in the Old Testament, where it said, let us make man in our image, you know, because the Holy Spirit was there as well. And that um, we also see in Malachi 3 verse 6, where it says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. So does God allow violence and tell his believers, say, nope, in the Old Testament, you can defend your family and yourself and your property, but in the New Testament, uh, you can't. No, because God is the same. He deals with sin, and he, he holds life as sacred, but there, there are also actions and repercussions for those who intend to do violence or try to take the lives of others. Um, he even goes back to Cain and Abel, where Cain killed Abel, and Cain was scared, and he says, well, you know, everybody's going to kill me. And he says, no, because, and what did God say? You remember, read the story. That's, that's for another time. But uh, anyway, we also have to understand that Paul, when he was preaching, he said that God's word, uh, he wrote to Timothy that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for training and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, is it a good work to defend your wife and children against a rapist. Somebody wants to torture them, sodomize them, murder them. Yep, I would say that is a good work of defending those who cannot defend themselves. Um, Paul, who was Saul, who knew the Old Testament back and forth, uh, upside down, backwards, forwards, the whole nine yards, he understood that all scripture is, is useful and profitable. Uh, we also need to go back to Luke 22 where Jesus, this is the greatest thing, 
uh, where he sent out his disciples for the second time. And he says, now, he said, remember the first time I sent you out, uh, did you need anything? He sent, sent you out with nothing. And he said, no. He says, well, now, uh, he says, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a sack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Luke 22, 36. Keep in mind that the sword was the finest offensive weapon available to individual soldiers. It is the equivalent of basically uh, what individuals can purchase today. Um, again, and, and you look at swords, spears, and bows and arrows. What we see is, is kind of like a knife or something for up close and personal. We see a spear is used to for greater distances, and of course the bow and arrow is for far-reaching uh, of attacking and defense. And, and the same can be said of a pistol. A pistol uh, can be, uh, especially in self-defense, most self-defense cases dealing with a pistol, those attacks occur on a person with a distance of 10 feet or less. Okay? Um, you know, a modern rifle might be compared to as a bow and arrow uh, for those long distance targets for defending yourself and your family. Okay, so anyway, we're continuing on in... Uh, what, the first thing that uh, Christians who don't believe in, in defending themselves or their family will say, well, well, Jesus, yeah, he had him get a sword, but that fulfilled a prophecy, and that was it. Unfortunately, we don't see that. What well, we see Jesus later on when the disciples say, see, Lord, we have two, he says, good, it is well. And that Jesus did two things. He fulfilled a prophecy that he was, you know, part of the rebel rousers, the, the bad guys, and that he also gave and continued on what we saw in the Old Testament that you can protect yourself against those who want to do violence against you because of crime, because of murder, because of rape or thief being a theft and it, and it turns into they will kill to take your personal possessions. Uh, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, those things. Um, but these, these, these Christians that say, you know, well, oh, you know, no, 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 Jesus, he, he talked about, uh, he rebuked Peter because he cut off the high, servant's, uh, uh, high priest servant's ear. Um, but when you read what Jesus said in Matthew 26, verses 52 to 54, he told Peter, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Notice that Jesus didn't say, throw the sword away. You're not supposed to have it at all. No. He said, put it in its place because there is a proper time to defend yourself. And Jesus didn't need Peter to prevent him from going and dying on the cross. That wasn't God's will. This example is not saying that we cannot defend ourselves as believers because obviously the whole time before that Peter had the sword uh, didn't escape the Lord's grasp or, or, oh, I didn't even know you had that thing, Peter. What are you doing with the sword? Get rid of it. Throw it away. You're not. No, we see, we see Jesus telling Peter and saying, hey, put the sword in its place because as we see in the Old Testament, there is a time and a place for everything. There's a time to defend yourself. And there's a time when wanton attacks against innocent people, that is what's forbidden. Um, it's not that owning a weapon is wrong, but it's how you use it and what you use it for. And clearly in the Old Testament, and Jesus agrees with this, that defending the lives of yourself or your loved ones, protecting your property is okay. Um, so anyway, again, the whole point is, is that that passage of scripture is no way can be used to say Christians today cannot have one of these and protect themselves and their family members. Um, it's interesting because in 1 Timothy 8 it talks about he who does not provide for his own, especially of his own household, he has denied the faith and worse than an unbeliever. That applies to food, water, medicine, shelter, protection, right? Protecting your wife and your family, your kids against uh, violence, uh, those who intend to do violence against you, against crime. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that we can install locks and that, or even to the point of where people say, well, that's the police's job. Well, the police isn't, if they're there, then yeah, they have a public charge to protect, uh, to protect the public. But if they're on the other side of town, it's not going to do you any good. You know, it, 
that old saying of you're being uh, raped and somebody's trying to murder you at this very second, the cops are minutes away. Now, I'm not saying that to put the cops in a, in a bad light, because like I said, I know a lot of people in blue for some strange reason. But just for the fact that there has never been a time in Scripture, in the Old Testament or the New Testament, where we have been forbidden to not protect ourselves or our family. It has never been rescinded. Um, but rather, we continue on with that. Um, I don't know, again, going back to Exodus 22, verses 2 through 3, we don't see anything where Jesus says, well, you know, well, you know this passage here, do away with it. We, we just don't see that. Uh, it's interesting that when we talk about this, again, God deals with our actions. We're going to be accountable for our actions, the things that we do and the words that we say. We look through the Old Testament. We see in the New Testament examples, clear examples, of that we, are sh that we should not act out uh, and commit violence against other people uh, because of hatred or anger or jealousy or out of a sense of revenge or vengeance. Uh, we know that that's wrong in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. But we don't see is anything forbidding us, uh, forbidding us to defend ourselves or our family or our property. Here's the, the thing, is that if you have a problem with anger, if you have a problem with self-control, if you um, cannot take on that responsibility of how to use one of these or any other type of weapon, even if that weapon is just a pen, if you cannot control yourself then you should not pick this up because you could do the wrong thing at the wrong time and you will be held accountable for that. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people in prison that are incarcerated today where they chose to act out of anger or act out of revenge or vengeance. And where did that get them? It broke God's law in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, and it, it ended up breaking the law of the civil magistrates, the police, the government that we have, and now they are paying the penalty and the fine by sitting in prison or jail or whatever the case may be. Um, <clears throat> anyway, it ends up that the believer is not to be, uh, is not to be soon uh, to be angry or not to be a brawler and not a striker, as uh, Timothy, or correction, Titus uh, chapter 1 verse 7 says. Again, um, if you have a problem with anger, or if you don't know how to control your emotions, or you don't know how to behave uh, like a big boy and girl with one of these, then you should not get, you should not get one of these, okay? Um, just get real good locks on your doors, but again, there is maturity uh, there's, a, there's wisdom that needs to be put in place, that needs to be acted upon, there needs to be common sense. Um, the other thing, uh, here's another important thing. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 31 to 32, it says, Do not envy a man of violence, and do not choose any of his ways, for the crooked man is an abomination to the Lord, but he is intimate with the upright. You see, there is a big difference between those who resort to violence outside what we see in Scripture in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We saw Peter when he struck off the ear of the high, high priest that that action at that time was wrong. But as we see, you know, Jesus said, hey, put your sword in its place. Put the weapon back because now is not the time. The time to use it is to protect yourself against those who intend to do violence against you to take your life or do horrible, unspeakable uh, things to you or to take your property. Use the appropriate level of force to prevent that person from doing that. And again, look back at Exodus 22, verses 2 and 3. Um, but Proverbs is very important. Don't envy a man of violence. And what we see is that the clear picture in the Old and the New Testament that those who defend themselves and their families that they're not a man of violence, of wanton violence against innocent people. But those are the people that are wise. And those that understand the command that God has given to love your wife, to love your family, to provide for them. There's a lot of ways that we can provide, and one of them is safety. A lot of people say, oh, well, you're supposed to provide a house and food and, uh, you know, be a good father and, uh, you know, a good parent to your kids. There's also safety. 
as a parent, you are charged just as the police uh, have been put in charge of the public safety that if they see that violent act happening, they have that charge to use the necessary force to stop that violence against that person at that time. The same thing that you are given the responsibility to take care and provide for the safety of your family and your loved one or those who can't defend themselves, the orphans, the widows, uh, the elderly, the infirmed, you know, people who can't defend themselves against somebody who is obviously bigger and stronger and bullying them and, and you know, intending to do them harm. So I know that's a lot of stuff. This is going to be a huge video series. But again, for those people that say, you know, well, you have to be a total pacifist. Um, no, we don't see that in Scripture. We don't see it in the Old Testament. We don't see it in the New Testament. And again, as I said before, there's a huge difference between dying for the sake of the gospel, preaching the gospel. Isn't it interesting that all these people say you can't defend yourself? Um, a lot of these people don't even preach the gospel. They say, well, see, uh, this person died. He was a martyr for the faith. Yeah, because they were preaching the gospel and they killed them because of the message that they were giving, that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. And that's the only way that you can get to the Father. Somebody comes up and shoots me for, for preaching that gospel message. To live is Christ, to die is gain. But we see that, def that, that, that split between preaching the gospel and doing what God does, wants us to do and preaching that message and dying for that gospel message. And then there's that other part where we are supposed to defend ourselves against those who intend to commit violence against us or our family. Now again... Uh, I want to make it explicitly clear that if you choose not to defend yourself or not to learn how to use a firearm or a knife or a club or a pen to uh, defend you and your family, that's entirely all right. There's many instances of where we see in World War I and World War II uh, in South America and third world countries where people, they, their government disarmed them and they had no weapons. And so they cried out to God and they prayed. And we see a lot of accounts where uh, the people who broke in and intended uh, to rape and torture and murder them, that when they prayed to God that that person just froze and freaked out or an angel showed up and uh, that act of violence was stopped in its tracks. But we see in the Old Testament, as we saw, that when the Philistines came against the Israelites and they forbid them and took away their weapons and their firearms, what happened? They enslaved the people. And that's wrong. You should never be enslaved. You should never get, let it get to the point of where somebody can abuse the power, their power over you or your family to do things that you, do, that you shouldn't be doing. But again, my whole point is that we are given an individual responsibility. We see it in the Old Testament. It hasn't been revoked in the New Testament under Jesus. And, uh, you know, it is your personal conviction. But don't go saying that there is no elements of biblical self-defense in the Old Testament or the New Testament because we see it clearly. And Jesus didn't change. He didn't say, you know, you can't have any weapons. You can't, you can't have one of these to defend yourself or you or your family. Jesus said, go buy, sell your cloak and buy a sword. The only reason that you have a weapon back then was to defend yourselves, to be able to show it. If somebody comes up and says, hey man, give me your wallet, give me your wallet. And then it came to the point of where they were going to do violence against you and you, you pulled out a weapon and it's like, hey. And they saw that you could defend yourself. More often than not, you weren't a victim of crime. As is today, that if somebody comes against me and tries to mug me or uh, murder me, do violence against me because uh, I'm protecting my wife and my daughter, and I pull out one of these, I am justified in using the appropriate level of force to stop that person from killing my wife and my daughter. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, ultimately, am I going to automatically jump to this? 
no, I'm not going to put myself or my family in a position where we're walking down dark uh, alleyways and uh, you know, whatever. You know, it's going to be like, hey, run. We'll run away. Run to live and fight another day. But if it gets down to where the last case scenario, the worst case uh, scenario is that I do have to use this, then that's what's going to have to be used because God has put my family under me and has charged me to protect them, to provide for them. So anyway, um, that's what we're talking about in biblical self-defense. Is it in the Bible? Yes. Is it in the Old Testament? Oh, yes. Um, over and over we see times and examples. And that's not even all the scriptures. There's more examples, okay? But it's just to give an answer for those people who said, you know, well, you need to look at the Bible. You need to, you need to study the Bible and find the truth. There's the truth. The truth of God's word shows that there is nothing wrong with defending yourself or defending your family or your property. Which is very different from dying for presenting the gospel. What's interesting is that there will be a lot of people who will make this claim that you're not supposed to have any type of weapons, you're not supposed to defend yourself, and yet very few of these people actually go out and preach the gospel at all. Statistics show that 95 to 97% of people have never verbally witnessed or preached the gospel to the lost person. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, we see those scriptures where, you know, physical training does have some use. If you don't train with this, you won't be proficient in it. And again, I'm not trusting in this. I'm not using this to give me courage. But again, like the word says, the Lord trains me up for battle, trains my fingers for war. It is okay to be skilled and proficient with this, and hopefully, Lord willing, I will never have to use it. It's like life insurance. It's like that fire extinguisher. You know, so many people, uh, oh, you can't have that, you can't, because that's, that's it, wrong and evil and bad, and you're blah, blah, blah. Well, what about the fire extinguisher in your house? What about your life insurance? If we apply their same logic to these other things in our lives, you will see that they fall short. The other uh, claim that uh, interesting claim that these people say is that, uh, well, look at the Beatitudes. It's not in the Beatitudes. Well, there's a lot of things that's not in the Beatitudes. I can pick out a passage of Scripture that has absolutely nothing to say with a lot of things, but that doesn't mean that uh, that discounts or discredits what is in the Bible. Just because it's not in that small passage? Just think about it. In the Beatitudes, there is nothing that talks about um, hmm, watching TV or watching those, those movies that uh, maybe you shouldn't be watching or on the internet late at night on the stuff that you shouldn't be watching or cars or, you know, you, you can go so far into the, into the ridiculous. But again, uh, just because it's not there in the Beatitudes doesn't mean that it's not authorized or sanctioned by God that you can't protect your family or your loved ones. You have to look at the whole context of God's Word, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and seeing that Jesus never forbid anybody. In other words, he didn't, he didn't go back and say, look at Exodus and look at all these examples here where you can defend your lives, your family, and your property no more. We don't see that anywhere in the New Testament. So in other words, we're supposed to continue providing for our family and our safety, and our safety as well. Um, hopefully, and we, we trust God for the outcome. Whatever happens, happens. And whether I live or die, or whether my family is overcome, even though I have this and use this, and even though I'm killed, ultimately, I trust in God. Because this is an inanimate object. My body is only here for a certain length of time. It's just a little while. What's more important is where I'm going to spend eternity after I take my last breath. But while I am here on earth, I have been given the charge to love my family, to put a roof over the head, to feed them, and to protect them. That's what it comes down to. So for those people that say, you know, you can't defend yourself at all, that's what I have found in Scripture, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So don't try to press uh, your personal conviction of not carrying a firearm and saying that it's unbiblical that I do carry a firearm. 
where I do uh, take the time to train my fingers for war to protect my family and their well-being and mine too. This should settle anything whatsoever. And again, I don't look down on anybody who chooses not to defend themselves. I think you're doing a disservice if that time ever comes. But again, we're all going to give an account to God. So, and what's important is preaching the gospel and that he is the only way uh, to get to the Father. So anyway, think about that. Preach the gospel. A little, lot of information about this, but a lot of stuff that we should be doing, preach the gospel. Why don't we do that? Why don't we try to die for the gospel? Preach that gospel until somebody, somebody says, you know what, enough is enough. Why don't you just preach the gospel just once? Why don't you, you get up and, and hand out tracts? Why don't you, you preach on a street corner just once the gospel message to those who are lost? Give that a shot. Because then when we do that, we come against the scripture. It talks about our battle is not against flesh and blood, but that battle is against those powers and those principalities that don't want the lost to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ and how their sins can be forgiven and how can they can be children of God. That's the fight. That's the true fight. This is all, it's secondary. It's a personal conviction at, at best. What's really important is the essentials, and that's Jesus Christ. So anyway, that's it for now. Take care. God bless. Peace.